Well, hello, welcome back to the studio. Today, a lovely autumn scene. Now, this painting really highlights three distinct parts of any painting. The good, the bad, the ugly, but maybe not in quite the same order. Sometimes, as you'll see in this painting, it starts off looking well, a bit ugly, and then it gets much better, and then, well, some bad bits. But I've kept those for the very end of the video, so make sure you watch all of it. I've used Bob Ross paints and brushes throughout, and I've used the Bob Ross technique to create this lovely scene. Now, if you don't have the Bob Ross paints, don't worry too much. You can use other brands just as well. But make special note of all the little top tips I give you throughout the video, because it will really help you to improve your technique and your style. So, you know the routine. Sit back, relax, notepad at the ready, and see if you can create your own lovely autumn scene. Happy painting people. So here's my canvas, 16 by 20, but portrait style, that's upright. First thing is let's add some acrylics. I've got a range of different brown tones, I'll list them in the description below. I've also got some nice highlighting colours, greens, oranges and Indian yellow. I've also been needing some blue, this time cobalt blue for a background sky. I'm going to divide my painting into thirds. Roughly two thirds for the background, one third for the foreground, with a bit of a slope to it. I start off with some cobalt blue and a touch of white for a background sky. The white stops the cobalt being too transparent. I just want a wash of colour here, so nothing special, just scrubbed on. There, that's about as good as it needs to be. For a few little cloud effects, I'm taking a touch of white acrylic and I'm just going to scrub this on to my background sky. Now, I don't expect these clouds to really show much in the finished painting, so this is just a little bit of fun, a little bit of painting exercise. I just let the brush skip and jump across the canvas. It's a cheap old brush I'm using, and I don't expect very much from it. I want my clouds to look very natural, but there's a problem. My blue wasn't quite dry, and you see, as I scrubbed on the white, it lifted off the colour. I'll leave it to dry for a few moments and then we'll do a little repair. This is one pickle I know that I can fix quite easily. I've added some burnt sienna and some dark umber to my palette with a touch of sap green. I want to just put in the background colours for some forests. I use just a small amount and just I want to really sort of map this out really, so I know I want the, the foreground to look like it's got a bit of a slope, maybe down to a nice pathway, so it gives me a good line, and background trees, but I don't want them to run out of position, so I start off by putting just a few little markers on. I then dip my brush into that lovely dark brown colour and just dab on some background foliage, but let's experiment with this dark sienna colour. Sienna is actually quite red in tone, so it really stands out. I think we'll have to fix that later on, if it shows. I think I'll add a few little highlights. Dark Sienna and a touch of that lovely bright yellow colour. It makes a lovely warm orange tone. At this stage of my painting, I'm just looking to fill the background with some colour, no real detail. These will be quite sacrificial in the finished painting. I'll let these paints dry for about 25 minutes. Let's add a little more structure to the background. I've got a synthetic liner brush. You can see I hold it well back down the handle. And I'm using a touch of black acrylic here, thinned out so it's thin like ink. I want to put in the suggestion of some branches and some trees. These are way off in the background. I want them just again to hold up the foliage. Whoops, made a mistake there. But I was quick and got my finger on it and rubbed it out. These trees on the left look fine, but the ones on the right, they, well, lean in a bit, don't they? It's a problem caused by painting from the left-hand side of the canvas so that I'm not in front of the camera. I'll add a few straight ones to even it up a bit. I wash my half-inch brush and add a few little touches of highlight to these background trees. Again, nothing special here. You'll find that acrylic paint actually dries substantially darker than when you apply it. 
So again, I think this is just really more a filler. I'll add a few touches here to the left hand side and then add a few touches more to the right hand side as well. I'll even try and cover up that bright orange splodge in the middle of my sky. To finish off the foreground, I just use whatever is left on my palette. Black, brown, whatever. Something nice and dark. And I just want to fill this in. This will be the underpainting for my foreground. So here's my painting so far. And I think it's fair to say that, well, it doesn't look great. This is a stage of the painting known as the ugly phase. You will find that there are lots of paintings that go through a phase where they're, well, they just don't look great. And it can be quite tempting for someone who's new to painting to sort of almost quit at this stage. It's a very common situation to find yourself in. But you'll have to trust me when I say learn to paint through the ugly phase. Your painting will come back and it will look lovely when you finish it. But you just have to sort of grit your teeth and go for it a bit more. So next time you find yourself with, well, an ugly painting, just remember... Like the duckling, there's a beautiful swan underneath. Now, back to the painting. I've got a new brush to play with, about a 3 8 inch synthetic brush. I want to add in some foreground trees, so these are going to come down lower in the painting. I'm using black acrylic again. As I mentioned, this is really the ugly phase of my painting, and, well, it doesn't look that great, does it? But never mind carry on because I know it'll come good. To remind us that the ground is sloping, the base of these trees has a little foot that tips into the center. I'll add a few branches as well and maybe a little bit more detail to these background ones. I leave it to dry completely before I'm moving on to oils. To begin the oil painting process I'm going to use this Bob Ross Liquid Clear. This needs to be applied very thinly, and I'm going to use an old landscape brush to do it. So I'm actually going to record this little section live. I'm not going to do the voiceover in this section. I want you to hear just how tough I am when I'm applying this liquid clear. And I, when I say scrub it on there, I mean get that old Bob Ross brush, a one inch brush, and really, really scrub it. I want a super thin coat on here. It should be just oily to the touch. If you can run your finger over it and you don't leave a trail, but it feels just a tiny little bit oily, then that's perfect. Any more than that, and it'll be too wet and too slippy and all your colors will run into each other and too dry and you will never get anything to blend. So let's press on with the liquid clear. Time to plan the painting. I've got a filbert brush and just a tiny touch of titanium white. I want a pathway disappearing here in the background of my painting. I'll put a little mark on the canvas so I know where my path is going to. I'll add a few more little touches to indicate how wide the path grows. I went a bit offline there, but never mind. It's fixed. I'll scrub in a little bit of white color here just to give an indication of how wide the path has grown. In the background, I want to put down the indication of some mist. Bob often used mist to disguise where one area overlapped another. Wow, that's a bit too yellow and a bit too bright. I'll give this a bit of a dry clean on some paper towel and try again. There are points in a painting where you have to learn to stop before you get yourself into too big a pickle. Yes, I was going the wrong way with that color and too bright. I wiped it off with a paper towel and dry clean my brush again. By stopping a little early, I saved myself a lot of heartache. I went back in with a touch more light and see if I can get a more subtle effect. That little background area is gonna get me into trouble later on in the painting. So make sure you watch the video all the way through. I want to mix up a lovely autumnal color. My favorite is Indian yellow and a touch of bright red. This makes the most fabulous, brilliant orange tone. Perfect for my painting. There, now you can compare it to the background. Whilst I'm making colors, I'll mix up some yellow ochre and a touch of the same bright red color. It will give me a slightly duller tone. Still beautiful, 
but just a little bit more restrained. I'll probably add some white to that later on, and maybe some of the other colours too, because we can tone these up or down with some dark sienna or Van Dyke brown. I changed to a nice new Bob Ross 1 inch brush, courtesy of one of my lovely subscribers. Thank you. Notice how I pull the paint down flat and just use one side of my brush. I always hold my brush so that I can see the little Bob Ross logo looking at me. Notice when I pushed back into the paint, I got this effect on my brush. A bright edge and the back of the brush nicely opened up. This is critical to getting the paint effect to work. Tip the brush about 45 degrees and come in just under that misty area and gently touch the canvas. The liquid clear grabs the colour from the brush. Don't worry about the tree trunks. We know where they are. We'll get them back. Now, as Bob would say, follow the lay of the land. Tap and work your way down the painting. Try not to go back over it two, three, four times because you'll just mix some mud. On the right side, I think a little more shadowy. So I use a little bit more of my yellow ochre colour. I tinted that with a touch of dark sienna, just to add a little more shadow to it. I play backwards and forwards with my orangey colours here, but you see, I leave a few gaps. I want another tone, or else this will look just like it's on fire. As I work forwards in my painting, I just let the brush run out of colour. Here you see, I've used more dark sienna mixed with my orange colours. Let's make a nice rich golden colour. Yellow ochre, a touch of white. There. Plenty bright enough for the left hand side. Once again, I dry clean my nice one inch brush and just push up into the paint to create a little line. It's just as critical to get this onto the brush as well as you did the orange tone. I'm aiming for the gap between some of the orange bands of colour. Once again, don't go back over that too many times. You'll end up removing all that lovely stippled effect and just creating mud. I've toned this color down with a little bit of dark sienna. I want this for this bottom left hand side where I think there'll be a nice shadow from a tree on the right hand side. I blend and play with my colors a lot. I want a huge variety of tones, just like you would see in a forest. Top tip, if your brush stops working, it's become clogged with paint. Stop and dry clean it thoroughly before you carry on. Time to find our trees again. I'll use the short blade of my knife and just scrape off this excess paint. Doesn't take very many moments to figure out where they all are. Now, I went a bit wrong here. I used my filbert brush and some Van Dyke Brown to block them in again. But it didn't quite work out as I wanted it to. The little bits of paint that were left on the trunks turned the colour sort of a pale brown tone. And I wanted them to be really quite black. So I put a little bit of black onto my palette and mixed it with the Van Dyke Brown. I used this predominantly on the left hand side of each of the trunks. That'll be more shadowy there anyway. If you're enjoying this tutorial, give this little painting a thumbs up. You can also subscribe to my channel. Don't forget, ring the bell. That way you get a message in your inbox when I release a new video. To highlight my tree trunks, I've added some dark sienna to that nice golden color I made earlier. Once again, I dry clean my filbert brush and I'm gonna use this just as touch and bump and let it run along the tree trunk. As you can see, it does tend to want to blend in very much with the black and the Van Dyke brown. So gentle pressure here is all that's needed. Now, I did overdo it a bit. So an easy repair, go back in to your Van Dyke brown and black tone. And as you see, just a few dabs of dark here and there to restore some of that nice texture. It doesn't take much though. I dry clean my filbert brush one more time and added some Indian yellow to sap green I think I added a touch of white to it as well. I want to just indicate maybe a little bit of moss growing on the sides of these trees. Once again, don't overdo it, but as you saw, it's easy enough to repair. So have fun with it. 
The light coming from the right of my painting means these trees are going to cast a nice shadow. I'm going to use some dark sienna again on that same filbert brush and I just want to stab the colour in. I want to continue the illusion that there is a nice texture here so I just don't paint it like a stripe. Use a stippling action instead. So here's my painting. I recovered that, well, slightly disappointing looking brown painting, the, the ugly phase, and I've turned it into something, well, a rather nice looking painting so far, but there's still more to do. I have to put the pathway in, and what is it Bob says? Um, a bravery test. Yes, I think we need a bravery test. I can't think of many things I could add to this painting except one. Let's see how I get on. For my pathway, I have a choice of weapons. I can either use a palette knife or carry on with a filbert brush. I like the palette knife most of the time, but I think, well, I'm going quite well with this today, so I'll use the filbert brush. The pathway and the tree trunks are done in a very similar fashion. I start by underpainting the path with some Van Dyke brown and black, but take note of the shape. I let it zigzag up and down and form these nice little sort of dips and curves. It gives my painting a more natural look. I don't really want it to look like it's a tarmac road. I also angle my brush up into the foreground here. A few more touches of highlight. Again, I'm just using some of that marble mix colour. I keep it a little brighter on the left and a little darker on the right. I also use a bit of a dipping stroke here to indicate that the path has some wear and tear. Again, it's a small touch, but it makes all the difference to the finished painting. Now, here's a bit of a signature trick that I like to use. A complementary colour. I use some Prussian blue, a touch of white, and a little bit of brown to make a sort of a nice sort of greyish tone. As I mentioned, it's a complementary colour, but doesn't it make that path come alive? Now, I know that this probably should have been more on the right-hand side of my path in the shadow area, but heck, it's my world, and I have it the way I want it. So time for a bravery test. A classic Bob Ross big old tree. But where to put it? On the right? On the left? Well, there's not much space here, is there? Top tip. Take a tree you don't care much for, like this one, and use it as the basis for a foreground tree. I'm using some Van Dyke Brown and Black, of course, and I'll just grow this tree so it's nice and wide. Stand back and check the sizes occasionally. These are all in a line, really, but I think it's okay if I just make it nice and wide. I'll get a few lovely lumps and bumps and add the odd branch here and there. I'm gonna be putting some autumnal foliage over this. So again, I don't need to add a ton of detail. I switched my liner brush with a little drop of thinners on it, just to add a few branches. Once again, don't overdo it though. In case you didn't get on using a filbert brush to highlight your tree, let's try using a fan brush. I'm using the same sorts of colors and I load the fan brush very well. As you see, it gives a slightly more, well, fluffy effect, a little more detail in fact, and it looks really bark-like. I want it brighter on the right and getting progressively darker to the left. Now, what about some foliage? The leaves on my tree want to hang into the painting like fingers, but I need to underpaint them first. This is a key point of using wet on wet techniques. I use a dark sticky colour first, this time dark sienna, a little bit of Van Dyke brown and black and a lizarin crimson. I want a sort of a chocolate brown, but with a red tone for an autumn colour. I've washed and dried my old one inch brush again. Perfect for an underpainting. The technique is as before. I like to see my little Bob Ross logo looking at me. I pull my brush one direction through the paint and then give it a little push. I'm trying to drive the paint to the right hand corner a little bit more. I just lean on that corner and as you see on the back of my brush there's more paint on that one corner. Now again brush tipped slightly over at an angle and just gently touch. The 
bristles are very bristly, as you see, and quite worn. They leave a nice speckly effect. I especially like to cover up those sort of raw ends where the branches and the trunk leave the top of my painting. This dark tea colour will act like a glue for a highlight colour. Top tip, make sure you always underpaint things like foliage for trees and bushes. Without, well, the tree just lacks depth and it's very hard to get your highlights to stick. Sadly, my fluffy clouds are a casualty, but never mind, I enjoyed painting them all the same. Now, let's load the brush again, same side, but this time I've loaded the left hand corner of the brush. And I tap to fill in some branches on the right hand tree. It's the same technique, but just leaning the brush to the left or leaning it to the right. Once again, we are creating a sticky textured background colour that a highlight colour will stick to. For a highlight colour, I've mixed some more Indian yellow and red and added a touch of white to it this time. I want this to really stand out against the background. Highlight paint is thinner and oily and it needs a softer, newer brush to work. But notice how I favour the corner of my brush again. Look at the back of the brush. It's all open and lacy. Again, if it doesn't look like that, well, it just won't work right. Favour the corner for this right hand side and gently touch. You could be a little bit rougher with the dark underpainting, but when it comes to highlights, be gentle. Save a little dark and do one little part of the tree at a time. Top tip, every once in a while, stop and check the end of your brush because as you apply highlights, well, you will be picking up a small amount of the dark color. And if you go back onto your palette, you're gonna contaminate your paint. Every once in a while, I just stop and touch it off on a paper towel. You don't need to dry clean it, just remove a little bit of dark color. I've added a small amount of dark sienna to my highlighting color gives a slightly more sort of burnt orange tone. Perfect for the shadow side of my tree. Again, notice how I load my brush. Same technique every time. So this is more for the left hand side and you can see it produces a really soft orange tone. In fact, I like it so much, I'm going to use it on the other tree on the right. As my colour becomes more contaminated, I'll use a little bit of this for my background trees. I don't want them to be competing with the foreground, so this slightly darker colour is perfect. I stood back from my painting, and I think this tree could do with just a little more highlight, just a sparkle of light on this right hand edge. I really want to make it jump from the canvas. I think probably the one behind it could do with a touch as well. Now I'm gonna add something called referred light. It's a bluish color that appears on the shadow side of the tree. Light can be reflected and bounced back from other objects in the painting like the ground, and it produces sort of like a halo. Now, don't get this too bright. It wants to be sort of a more of a subtle bluish tint. If you have a look at trees in a forest, at the back edge, you'll often see a bluish tone. It's faint, but again, it makes my painting really stand out. These little touches and details are what will improve your paintings immensely. Another little touch is some fine detail. Across my path, I've blown some leaves. I use the point of my palette knife and I go into various colors, golds, yellows, reds, 
and I just touch and let the knife bounce across the surface of the canvas. Did you notice I added some wildlife to my painting? If you look carefully, you'll see there are one or two little extra details that I've added. One more little touch of highlight and I think my painting is almost finished. Well, almost, but that's for the very last section of the video. Make sure you watch the outtakes. I was trying to wring one more final detail out of my painting, so I thought I'll add a little bit of golden light to the background at the end of the path. Nah. I'll try again. Maybe something a little bit brighter and smaller. Nah. All I did was smudge the end of the path. I'll fix that now. My last attempt produced a bonfire. Sometimes you gotta know when to quit. So there we have it. A lovely autumnal scene. The good, the bad, the ugly. But not in that order, of course. Especially the bad just to remind ourselves that sometimes there isn't anything else to be gained from trying to squeeze a bit more into a painting. If you've enjoyed this, there's another fantastic video for you to watch next. Until we meet again, happy painting people.